Chapter 1. First look at computer parts and tools. Our main objectives for this chapter is learning about the various parts inside of a computer case and how they connect and work together. But we're going to learn about how to protect both ourselves and the equipment against the dangers of electricity. We're also going to talk about the tools that we are going to be working with, as well as safety precautions that we must uh, take to protect, again, the equipment. So let's start off with what's inside the case. So what's a computer case? Uh, normally a computer case, uh, sometimes referred to also as a chassis, it holds all of the major components. That includes like, things like the motherboard, the power supply, processor, memory, uh, all the different types of expansion cards, as well as it can come in multiple different flavors like a tower, or a desktop, or a laptop, or an all-in-one. Now, the tower versus desktop, they're all very subjective. Normally, for tower, I would like to say uh, the case rises or towers over a desk versus a desktop, which might lie flat on the desk. Uh, a laptop case, obviously, is a laptop. An all-in-one is a unit that has everything all together. Now these are just some of the case types that are out there, not all of them. Now it's important that we recognize things by sight. So here are some of the common ports that we might have to interact with. Starting from the top and working our way down. The top is a VGA. Normally it's, tip, uh, it's blue. It's also known as a DB15 because it's kind of in the shape of a D. It has 15 pins, and it's a female. That means it takes a male. The male actually will have a pin that will penetrate it. Next is an S-video, which is typically either a 4 or 7 pin round video. Normally black. Next, DVI, which stands for Digital Video Interface Port. The DVI does come in multiple flavors, but this is what a typical standard DVI does look like. Next, HDMI. That is a still video port. The interesting thing here, though, is this is becoming more and more common because of end users wanting to connect it to their TV. Next is Display Port, which is a digital video and audio. It no longer supports analog transmission, and it actually is slowly replacing all other forms of video. Next is a Thunderbolt port. Normally you find these in, on Apple or Macintosh based PCs, or Mac based computers. Lastly on this slide is a Ethernet port. This is what allows us our network connectivity. Next will be our audio. This is a typical standard or typical <laughs> five audio port setup. The colors are important. Normally the pink, green, and blue are pretty standard. That means it allows you to have one mic, one set of speakers, and one more additional input. The black and orange allow for multi-speaker setup so that you can have more than just two speakers working together. Next is a SPDIF, which stands for our Sony Philips Digital Interface. It allows for digital audio, essentially better audio. Next is our basic USB ports. Notice the internal portion is flat and black. If it is USB 3, it will be blue. Next is our Firewire, also sometimes called our IEEE 1394 port. Just because that's the uh, standard, which is IEEE 1394, that's the official standard for Firewire. Next is our external SATA or eSATA. SATA is just a data connection for typically hard drives or for optical drives. 
here we have the option to have them external, not inside the case, but outside the case. Next, slowly being replaced by USB, but they're still here, is our PS2 ports. They're color-coded purple and green. Purple is keyboard, green is mouse. These are very specific ports. When a motherboard turns on, if they have PS2 ports, it will detect them first. If there's nothing there, the ports themselves get turned off. So you cannot plug in a PS2 port once the computer is already on because if the PC detected that nothing was there, those ports are already turned off. Lastly is a serial port or DB9. It has nine Mel pins, again in the shape of a D, and this is our serial. One more set of slides or interface uh, connections that are old but still might be out there. A DB25 female, also known as a parallel port. Next is a modem. These ones are rare, but I mean they still might be out there. So now let's talk about how everything is together. Here's an example of a nice internal setup of a computer case. You have your power supply on top, you have power cables and data cables. Here the data cables are red thin cables that connect our optical drive and the two hard drives. We have a, a processor and processor fan. The fan in the center of it uh, is our processor fan. Underneath there is our processor. We have expansion cards and things like that. For this, I like to be able to have it in front of you so we can touch and handle the components. But let's talk about what's, what's more about inside there. So, what's a motherboard? Uh, sometimes called a system board or a MOBO or I mean, there's different, a lot of different terms for it. But essentially, a motherboard is the part of circuitry that handles input from everything else. Everything is connected one way or another back to the motherboard. The brain of the computer is the processor or the CPU. Uh, it actually processes most of the data and instructions for the entire system. It does regenerate a lot of heat, hence the why it has to have a fan. Though it's not just a heat sink or a fan, it's normally a combination of both. A heat sink is just a metal spreader, and then a fan sits on top of that to draw the heat away. Here is an example of our expansion cards or, or adapter cards that are connected to our motherboard. We have our eSATA, our USB, HDMI, DVI, Ethernet, audio, USB 3. So these are already all interfaces that we've talked about, but now we have a photo with all of them together. Another major component of this is the processor and processor fan, which is right behind the components. So now that we've talked about the expansion cards, the adapters, the processor, now let's talk about memory. Memory modules, also known as Random Access Memory, RAM, acts as temporary storage for our processor. They normally come in different ways. Uh, uh, one of the most common ones are called Dual Inline Memory Modules, or DIMMs, and those are slots that hold our memory. Notice the color here. There are two black, two blue. One of the blacks has memory installed. This is important because later on we will discuss the differences between the colors. Next is our storage. Because memory is temporary storage, so now we have to talk about longer term storage. Longer term, uh, longer term storage comes in two different types. Either a uh, permanent long term storage, like an optical drive, or 
not so permanent, which would be our hard drive or our SSDs. So the, the big difference here is permanent storage that's done on a DVD, for example, is going to not be typically easily be able to be edited or added to or removed and is normally not where you install programs or things like that. That's what a hard drive is for because the hard drive is used for everyday long-term storage. Uh, the hard drives come in two different types, magnetic or solid state. The big difference here is our solid state has no moving parts, is smaller, and is a lot faster. But I mean, there's more to it than, than just that. I want to save a part of that for our hard drive chapter just so that we can drill down into the nitty gritty of our hard drive technology, our storage technologies. One of the last things is our power unit. So our power unit, power supply or PSU or other numerous names for it, comes in two voltage uh, manner. They come where they can accept 115, which is standard in the US, or 220, which is standard in other countries. But that way, you can just flip a switch and have it take one or the other. So now let's talk about our form factors. So we talked about our motherboard, we talked about our cases, but we didn't talk about our form factors. So what's a form factor? Essentially, a form factor is the standard that our motherboard and desktop or case have to meet so that all of the holes that are pre-drilled line up. And our form factor normally says size, positioning of the holes, uh, which way uh, is up, which way is down, things of that nature. And they come in two common standards, ATX or a mini slash micro ATX. While these are not the only two, these are just two of the most common ones. ATX stands for Advanced Technology Extended and is, again, one of the most commonly used factors today. It actually states where the power connector is. I mean, it lays out very specific details on just about anything dealing with our motherboard and or case. The important parts of our ATX standard is it also lists the specific power requirements that an ATX power supply must meet. This is one of those important ones because it's about names or acronyms as well. So the first primary power connector is called a 20 or 24 pin P1 connector. That's a large bundle of power cable that provides most of the main power to the motherboard. Newer motherboards require an additional either 4 or 8 pin auxiliary connector, normally around the processor, to give the processor more power than it might need. We've already talked about the 24 pin P1 connector. Now let's talk about two specific other types of connectors. That's a 6-pin or 8-pin PCIe connector. While the auxiliary and the PCIe both have an 8-pin version, they are not the same. The PCIe power connectors are done in a specific manner so that they can deliver a specific amount of power to video cards. And it's different than the power requirement for an 8-pin auxiliary connector. There is a micro ATX case, which is again, it's a smaller version of an ATX case. And normally it doesn't have as many power connectors because it's a lot smaller. Here's an example of the micro. It's a lot smaller than a typical standard ATX or even a mini ATX case. Now let's move on to our data connections. Notice here our P1 connector, which is in the center of the board, which is the white connector that provides power. Normally with ATX standard or mini, it's not located there. It's located 
more towards the memory. So I mean our standards kind of dictate where things are laid out. Now that we talked about our motherboard, now let's talk about our different types of hard drives. Normally our hard drives come in two basic standards, serial or parallel. Serial, which is the most widely used standard today because it's a newer standard and because it allows for serial connection, which is performing one task at a time and it's been shown to be a little faster. Parallel, which is slower than serial, has a different type of ribbon cable. Parallel has a 40 pin cable and can accommodate two connecting devices per cable. It allows for two cables per controller. The controller is what allows the hard drive to talk to the motherboard, thus allowing four total IDE devices or ATA devices. Here's an example of our cable. This will be a 34 pin cable versus a 40 pin cable, but essentially they're the same thing. The major difference between the two is if you look at the photo, the blue is the IDE or ETA, the black is our floppy. The black one is just slightly smaller than our blue one. That's really the only difference. Notice there's a notch there. That notch prevents the cable from going in the wrong way. Now that we talked about all about the, the components, now let's talk about the safety. Since we did bring up a power supply, the power supply does prevent or does produce power, we have to understand the importance of electricity as well as how to protect ourselves and the equipment. Basically, we don't want to get shocked or shock the equipment. Now let's talk about the measurement and properties of electricity. There are two types of current when we deal with electricity. AC or alternating current, which be <coughs> which is a sine wave, uh, basically it oscillates between a negative and positive voltage. Uh, our house is typically AC. Direct current, which is travels in one direction and is actually more efficient but doesn't go as far as AC. Now we have to talk about some of the things that will allow us to convert back and forth. So a rectifier versus inverter. Rectifier, AC to DC, and an inverter goes from DC to AC. While a transformer is a device that changes the ratio of between voltage and current. So if we want less current, more voltage, we could actually have it sent through a transformer to get more current with less voltage. The, I always have an issue explaining volts versus current versus resistance. So voltage is the difference in a charge between two points. Current is the rate at which the charge is flowing. Resistance is a material's tendency to resist the flow of change. So essentially, current is the natural rate of flow. Voltage is a pressurized rate of flow. Resistance is the pressure preventing that change from happening. Typically in AC, the electrical current will flow through a hot line to a, from a power station to a device and then it'll have a neutral line to return back to the power station. That way it's a complete circuit. One line will be sending electrons, the other line will be getting them back. When AC flows an, un an unintended path, one with less resistance a short can occur and that is where the path does not go from power to the light back to the power. It could just bypass the light uh, thus producing a short. 
A short is also defined as a sudden increase in the flow that can create a sudden increase in temperature. The fact that there's flowing electrons, it generates heat. The more pressure, the more voltage, the more current, the more heat. The neutral line is grounded to prevent uncontrolled electricity in a short. The ground is grounded to earth. And that is, grounding is the line that is connected directly to the earth so that electricity can flow into the earth itself. A typical standard house outlet has a neutral, has a hot, has a ground. The ground in this photo is the bottom circular part. The hot is the smallest plug. Our neutral is the largest straight plug. That way you cannot accidentally plug these in backwards. The neutral is larger than the hot, thus not allowing someone to accidentally stick it in the wrong way. Again, a typical house outlet is 100 between 110 and 120 volts in the US. Now, when we, will, when we work with electricity and electrical devices, first thing we want to talk about is connecting or verifying the disconnected power from the device. That way, if we're working on it, we do not have to worry about power being sent to that device. We also have to think about potential dangers and what they may include. If the power cord is frayed or damaged, that can cause an issue. If we're dealing with a uh, water or other conductive material, uh, things that might be physically damaged, things that have a strong electrical odor, a uh, power supply or power unit that's making a whiny noise or smelling kind of off, or obviously if you see smoke. The smoke is always a very common one. If you see smoke, that's bad. When we're working on sensitive equipment, we always want to ground ourselves. Basically, that is us connecting our potential to whatever we're working with potential. That way, electricity can flow naturally between us. That way there is no difference, thus not being able, to, either one of us, to have a discharge. Uh, now when we work with things like power supplies, printer, the CRT monitors, normally we don't at all. We do that because these are specific devices that... These are very specific devices that normally only trained professionals should touch is because the danger is very high. Uh, normally these are also things that may be considered filled replaceable units or FRUs. Basically that means if you go out on a, a service call these are parts that you may have in your vehicle just that way if they need to replace the power supply you have one. You don't worry about trying to fix their power supply you just replace it. Uh, also, now we start talking about our fires and safety regulations. If you have a fire, you don't just throw water on it. Sometimes water and fire do not mix. It all depends on the type of fire that you're dealing with. Because normally, most likely, water is going to be conductive. Thus, an electrical fire, throwing water on it will just spread the danger. Instead, you want to use a approved fire extinguisher that is rated for the situation that is going on. Because there are different ratings. Class A, which it's normally used for water and it puts out fires caused by wood, paper, or other combustibles. Versus Class B, which is puts out fires caused by liquids. Class C is non-conductive chemicals to put out a fire caused by electricity. Each one of these does a very specific type of fire, and thus you want to use the appropriate fire extinguisher. 
The classifications are also on them. That also includes verifying that the extinguishers are serviced, that they are up to date, that they are filled. That way, in an emergency, you know that they're going to function. Now let's go, jump back to our electricity. Let's talk about our ESD. So we talked about the same polarity, the, the same potential. So essentially what that means is if we're the same current between both us and the uh, case, there is less likely for ESD or electrostatic discharge because we are the same polarity. ESD normally happens when two devices or two items have different polarities. One has more, one has less. Thus, there's a discharge trying to equal them out. ESD causes two types of damage. Catastrophic failure, which destroys a component, especially very specific components like our processor, our memory. They're more sensitive to ESD. Or, ESD could also cause an upset failure, which basically just damages the component, or it only kind of works. So how do we prevent ESD? We prevent ESD by either holding on to metal of the case, or by using a grounding bracelet, or using some form of grounding mat. Essentially, anything that will allow us to have the same polarity as the case. The most common one is going to be an ESD bracelet, or by holding your skin to the case. The bracelet's always the best idea, but sometimes they're not always around. So six simple rules when we talk about ESD is whenever we're passing a circuit board or other component to another person, ground yourself first. Rule two, leave components inside anti-static bag until you're ready to use them. Number three, work on hardwood floors, not carpet. Carpet can uh, build up static electricity. Rule four, don't work on a computer in a cold or dry atmosphere. Rule five, remove packing tape and cell phone from the work area, thus minimizing materials that may attract ESD. And lastly, keep components away from your hair and clothing. Your hair and clothing can cre uh, cause ESD. Okay, so the typical tools are grinding bracelet, which we just talked about, a screwdriver, normally both flathead and Phillips, a torque screwdriver set, tweezers, an extractor, normally software, and many other non-essential tools could exist. Also, normally some form of a uh, toolbox. It could also be some power supply testing equipment, a flashlight, some, some air, things of that nature. Now let's talk about some of the unique things that you might uh, encounter. Uh, there are post-diagnostic cards Post is power on self tests, and basically what happens when a PC first starts, it goes through posts. It checks the power, memory, video, processor. It checks those four items and lets you know that those four items are working. If it doesn't, then it'll give you some random, well, it won't be random beeps, it'll be a very specific beep code. If all of them are working, there's no problems, there should be one beep. Just beep, and it should uh, go to the next section. Uh, postcards are rare, but I mean they do exist. Uh, they actually help you verify the BIOS. The BIOS is a basic input-output system. That is essentially all of the instruction sets that are set on the motherboard before the computer loads Windows. And they can be broken up into the system BIOS, the startup BIOS, and the BIOS setup. The BIOS setup is what's 
holds the motherboard settings. The system BIOS is what manages the simple devices. The startup BIOS starts the computer. All of this is stored in some form of CMOS memory, which that also includes the date and time, and that also includes the basic software to manage all of this, normally the firmware or BIOS. Next, the power supply tester, and that allows us to verify the power supply and how much power it's getting. That also allows us to verify how much power it's putting out as well. A multimeter, which allows us to test or measure individual power lines to verify that we're getting a very specific type of elect uh, electrical output that we're expecting. For example, we test a DC 12 volt line. We want to see round about 12 volts. It might fluctuate 11.95, 11.96, or could be even over 12. Or it could be 12.01, 12.02, and these are just ranges. So it needs to be round about the range. Now there are three typical measurements that we're looking for. 12 volt, 5 volt, and 3.3 volt. Uh, some form of loopback plug, which is essentially just a way to test the NIC to verify that it's working. Uh, next is cleaning supplies. That includes canned air, that includes uh, cotton swabs or cotton wipes, things of that nature. That also includes cleaning up material that we're not sure about. And that brings us to the, the portion of the uh, conversation where we have to talk about the material, safe, uh, material safety data sheet, the MSDS, which basically it tells us how to clean up very specific chemicals. For example, we see a green goo in the hallway and we have to clean it up. You don't, know, you don't know how to properly clean it up without a MSDS to let you know what chemical that may be and the proper cleaning solution that would do it. That way you don't accidentally mix chemicals that can cause poisonous gas. For example, Windex, ammonia, or bleach. Two very common household cleaners used to clean the bathroom that does make a poisonous gas. That includes uh, wipes, Q-tips, all types of different types of cleaning solutions, depending on what you are going to get. The reason I say this is just because there's going to be a wide range of cleaning solutions that are out there, and Sometimes you're not sure which ones to get. Normally I carry cotton swabs and alcohol, rubbing alcohol. That way, that will help me clean most areas that I run into. Maybe not all, but, but more common ones. One of the last areas we have to talk about is managing cables. One of the biggest issues when we talk about safety and computers is the safety of the cables. Uh, us hooking up a PC and leaving cables hanging or dangling or untied, these are all areas that can cause end users to trip or us to trip and it just looks more professional to have them tied up or twist tied or managed in such a way where they're covered. last object that we have to discuss is lifting heavy objects. And this is pretty straightforward, which is basically if you need help, get help. Lift with your uh, legs, don't lift with your back. Don't uh, twist, uh, hold it close to your chest. Be careful. And I'll let you get over the summary. I want to thank you and hope you guys have a great afternoon. If you have questions or comments, please let me know. 
and we'll try to accommodate uh, all input. Again, thank you. Have a great day. Bye.